if you're thinking about getting a Firebird, some planning is needed, okay? Almost planning permission, to be honest with you, because it's massive. It's a massive guitar. And uh, you're gonna need to get special, you know, floor stands for it, and a van to carry it around in, basically, because it's massive. Apart from that, it's a great guitar. It really is a great guitar. I'm so pleased I got this. I can't see any big globs of glue <laughs> or file marks or anything. I wonder if we can find anything wrong with it later. Trush rod cover, I have found some wonky screws. It's too good to be true, wasn't it? Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Guitaristas. Today, it's another new guitar, of course. Today, it's the Epiphone Firebird. <laughs> I'm quite excited. Been after one of these for ages. It seems like ages. I think it's probably over a year since these were in stock here in the UK at least. So, you know, I've been closely monitoring the situation uh, and, and the gas has been building. So here it is, um, £499 I paid for it as well, which I think is pretty good because they were selling for, I think they were selling for more than that last time they were available. Retail price is listed in the UK, 599 I got this from Guitar Guitar, 499 But I think, I think you'll find they're, they're available across a range of retailers. Not so necessarily in the in the States. I checked Sweetwater, they've listed it at 649, but out of stock at the moment. So I'm not sure what the situation is elsewhere for you guys, but hopefully they're on their way if you're waiting. I think a few people are saying that, you know, warehouses are filling up with, with stock again now, which is good news for us um, guitar addicts, obviously. So yeah, look, I'm rambling already. What I'm going to do is a deep dive review of this today because it's quite a different guitar. It's quite original. It's got quite a lot of original features in, you know, from the way that it's made to, you know, the specs, pickups and stuff. So we'll have a, a deep dive look at this today. Um, obviously, it's going to be quite a long one, half an hour or so, I would have thought. So if you haven't got that amount of time on your hands, timestamps are in the description box. So you can quite easily skip forward to any particular part of this review that, that interests you, i.e. what it sounds like or, you know, what the neck measurements are. So don't be, don't be afraid to do that. I won't be offended. If, however, you've got a little bit of time on your hands, go and get a drink, maybe even a little snack <laughs> and come back and join me for the ride and we'll get stuck in. All right, let's do it. First off, brief history of the Firebird, of course. So Gibson original, obviously, I assume you knew that. Introduced in 1963, at a time when Gibson was was really experimenting with lots of different things, weren't they? They dumped the Les Paul at that point. They they stopped making Les Pauls in 1960, didn't they? Introduced the SG, called that the Les Paul, or some of those, the Les Paul, you know, for a couple of years. Carried on making the SG through uh, that decade, the 60s. But there was a lot of changes. So the Firebird they introduced in 1963, this version which we call we call this reverse firebird I think because of the body shape there were various different specs I suppose you call it versions of it so there's the firebird one which is a single pickup wraparound bridge there was the firebird three which is two pickups wraparound bridge and short maestro vibrola there's the pictures <laughs> illustrating what I'm talking about. And then there was the Firebird 5, which is two pickups, tunematic bridge, and a long Maestro Vibrola. <laughs> there you go. And the Firebird 7, which had three pickups, tunematic bridge, and long Maestro Vibrola. 
So loads of different versions in just two years, 1963 to 1965. They stopped making it in 1965. <laughs> Apparently it turned out too expensive <laughs> for reasons we'll go into in a bit, the way that it's made. But yeah, they only made it 63 to 65. It then changed to what we call the non-reverse Firebird um, with a set neck. That's the subject for a whole other film, and, and hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, I'll get a non-reverse Firebird and, and we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, this, this version was made for a couple of years and um, wasn't introduced again or reintroduced again until early 80s when they started to, you know, sort of realise that some of their older models were uh, of interest to people, you know, at that time. Famous players, Johnny Winter's the one that always springs to mind, isn't it? He's, he's well known for playing mostly Firebirds. Lots of other people played them as well, dabbled with them for a bit, or played them a lot. Phil Manzanera from Rocks and Music played one right through his early career. Brian Jones of the Stones played one through his short-lived career. Steve Jones from the Pistols dabbled with one, I think, which is great because that gives me an excuse to maybe <laughs> roll out a Pistols riff later on. How's it made then? It's quite different, this. So here we go. This is, this is what they call a, a set through neck, which basically means the neck is all, ugh, the neck and the body are all one part. All this down here, all that is one block of wood. There you go, there's no join. You can see that, can't you? No join, the neck goes straight through, solid. So, sonically, it's got to be different, hasn't it? It's got to be different to your average guitar, or, or even your above average guitar, which will either have a bolt-on neck or a, a set neck, glued-in neck. This is set through, it's all the way. And these parts here, the wings, which we will call the wings, because they're the wings, basically, they're glued on. They're attached to this block in the middle. And as you can see, the block in the middle is slightly thicker than the wings at the front and at the back. Interesting, isn't it? And it's also, <laughs> it's nine ply that way, okay? Mahogany, and then these strips here, you can see that, can't you? A walnut. So you've got mahogany, you've got nine ply, mahogany, walnut, mahogany, walnut, mahogany, walnut, mahogany, walnut, mahogany. Count them. Nine, isn't it? Mahogany, walnut, mahogany, oh hang on, I lost count already. Mahogany, walnut, mahogany, walnut, mahogany. Walnut, mahogany, walnut, mahogany. There you go, nine. That four and five's nine, isn't it? And this Epiphone is made the same way as the Gibson ones, which is exactly the same. So this is a really good, was a really, well, as far as I can see, it's a fabulous recreation of the Gibson version. And I did own a Gibson version of this. This is particular model in the vintage Sunburst. I owned a Gibson, one of these. Briefly, <laughs> several years ago now, I owned one briefly. When I started getting the guitar addiction bad, <laughs> yeah, the, the manager of a local shop, um, <laughs> he managed to convince me to buy one once. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're watching, Adam. He, he managed to convince me to buy one once, and uh, I did. And I, I took it home and I thought, what the fuck did I buy this for? I really didn't think it was for me, and at that time it probably wasn't. So I took it back and, and used a few QC issues to, <laughs> to avoid the embarrassment of saying, oh, you know what, this is not really for me. Having, having said that, he then he managed to convince me to trade it in for a Les Paul Custom that cost twice as much. So I think he won in the end anyway. Point is, it's quite a unique guitar. Well, no, the point that I was trying to make was that I know that this is 
very impressive, this Epiphone version of the Gibson, because I owned a Gibson, which is pretty much exactly like this, as far as I can tell. I think one of the reasons I didn't, I didn't gel with it at that point is, if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about getting a Firebird, some planning is needed, okay? Almost planning permission, to be honest with you, because it's massive. It's a massive guitar. It's just a massive guitar. It's like really long. You can't, you can't put it on a normal stand. Uh, uh, you know, you have to reconfigure all your wall hangers because it's so much longer than most of your other guitars. It's a good, I don't know, it's probably about four inches longer than a, than a normal guitar. So, you know, your carefully configured wall hangers, you know, you know, above the shelf, you know, you won't be able to use them because it will knock your books off. <laughs> and uh, you'll need to get special, you know, floor stands for it and a van to carry it around him, basically, because he's massive. But, and there is a but, I've spent some time playing it in the last few days and I absolutely love it now. I really love it. And I'm going to play it in a bit, obviously, once I've taken it apart and put it back together and... and and hopefully you'll, you'll hear why. So before I do that, let's have a much closer look now. Um, let's weigh it. So it's not what I would say is a heavy guitar. It's, it's definitely not Les Paul-like weight. It's obviously massive and it's weird, but it doesn't seem to have any obvious neck dive. Let's see what it weighs. £7.13, which of course is 3.56 kilograms. So yeah, it's, it's nice weight. So getting back on track, uh, the neck, they call that a slim taper C. It feels quite nice. We'll measure that in a minute and um, we'll have a closer look at the, the profile. It's got a, an Indian laurel fingerboard, medium jumbo frets trapezoid inlays and the binding which is a nice color and i can tell you now the fretwork looks great no issues no nibs on on these frets obviously because they're epiphone and not gibson but yeah nice and tidy nice tidy job um graph tech new bone nut looks good the headstock, as you can see, is, is obviously that unique design, which, which gives us a, a longer string run on the low E, as opposed to the high E. If you imagine like Fender, like Stratocaster, for instance, the, uh, the longer run is on the high E string, whereas this is the reverse of that, which will also add, I imagine, to the, to the tone, the tonal characteristics of this, this design as a whole. There's quite a lot of... You know, those things are going to add up to something quite different, aren't they? Uh, as well as the pickups, which, which I'll talk about in just a second after I've referred to the Grover tuners. Proper, full-fat Grover, 18 to 1 ratio tuners. No expense spared there, which is really adding up to a fabulous value for money on this, this Epiphone. strings off so what was going to actually I probably should have showed you while the strings were on but the great thing about this headstock as opposed to the normal Gibson 3 plus 3 which we call it 3 on a side like the Les Pauls the strings on this pretty much go straight to the each tuners so it definitely helps tuning stability uh, this has been really solid rock solid since I've been playing it relentlessly for the last three days, probably. So, and uh, obviously now we can look at the frets. These were pretty tidy, actually. I didn't, I mean, I haven't, now I think about it, I didn't feel any grittiness or dirtiness. And I have been playing it, but as you can see, it's, it's pretty well presented, this. The board, you know, looks nice enough. It, it doesn't look especially dry. As I said, it's Indian Laurel, this, which is de rigueur, de rigueur, par for the course nowadays on, on Epiphone, inspired by Gibson Range. It looks attractive enough. It does the job, you know, at, at a cost. 
and presumably it's more sustainable than rosewood or ebony. So I'm I ain't mean I ain't I ain't meaning I ain't moaning about that. Bit dirty up there, but so that's all good and the frets are tidy. Yeah, nice and tidy, no problems at all. Let's have a look at the profile and measurements. So here we have the neck profile and measurements at the first fret. And here's the neck profile and measurements at the 12th fret. It's got a little bit of that Epiphone D. It's not too bad though. No QC issues. You can't, you can't see any paint blemishes. It's all seamless here where the binding joins the, the paint, the neck and the fingerboard. I can't see any big globs of glue <laughs> or file marks or anything. No raised frets as far as I can see. A really sweet job, really nice job. It looks, it looks, it doesn't look like a £499 guitar. Although I suppose, let's, let's face it, in the scheme of things nowadays with the sort of stuff that some of the other companies are putting out for far cheaper than this, £499 not necessarily, it's not cheap, is it? It's affordable. On this occasion, I think it, it represents really good value for what we're getting here. There seems to there seems to be attention to detail. Just looking, I'm running ahead of myself a little bit, but that's the way it works for me, unfortunately, sometimes. The screws all seem to be straight. I wonder if we can find anything wrong with it later. Let's, <laughs> let's soldier on and see. Uh, let's talk about the, well, let's talk about the hardware first. Standard Epiphone Loctone hardware. There you go. Pretty much. Epiphone branding on the bottom. Standard stuff. Let's just weigh it because we can. So there you go, tailpiece. 70 grams. Bridge. 46 grams. FYI. Great thing about these is you can put them back on and because of the, the lock tone system, they'll stay on. They won't fall off when you flip it over which is useful because it avoids, you know, knocking the the setting out, obviously. And this is, this to say, the action was great on this, so I'm not going to touch that. Right, let's, um, well, before we go any further, yeah, three-way switch, two volume, two tone, gold top hat knobs with silver inlays, a white three-ply pick guard with, with the Firebird uh, graphic in red, which looks really nice, really fetching. There you go, I'm getting good at this, I'm covering it all, aren't I? Now, let's talk about the pickups. Original Gibson Firebird pickups look like this, which look like mini humbuckers, but they're not mini humbuckers. They're original pickups that were made for the Firebird. And they differ to mini humbuckers in that a mini humbucker is a humbucker, whereas apparently Gibson Firebird pickups are more like what they, they call it more like a fat single coil pickup. So I'm assuming that means that Firebird pickups are actually single coil and not necessarily humbucking. Humbucking. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a little bit of a vague description. The main, I think mean, the main important thing is that Firebird pickups are different to mini humbuckers. So that's the main thing, you know. These ones here in this Epiphone are called Epiphone Pro Bucker. FB720. What these are closest to, I couldn't tell you to be honest with you. Epiphone Pro Bucker FB720. So have they been specially made for the Firebird or for the Epiphone Firebird? I don't know at this point, unfortunately. Um, but so, well, that wasn't really very helpful, was it? But it, it's information. It's telling you what I don't know, I suppose. Is, is, I suppose that's as useful as telling you what I do know. Is it? I'm not sure. Let's unscrew them and have a look underneath before anyone notices. First off, the reading on the bridge is 7.76K, 3.66 Henry's, 
and on the neck 7.83 kilo ohms 3.67 henrys okay and the middle reading 3.89k there you go let's have a look underneath okay let's have a look here you are there's in the cavity so you can see in the neck cavity it's uh it's all single piece they've just routed out the pickup cavity and as we can see this goes i'm going to take the pick guard off in a minute because clearly the wiring goes through to that so i wonder how hollow that is underneath but yeah you can see the the lamina the strips of mahogany and walnut in there obviously you've got your your, your sticker in there it says firebird vs vintage sunburst and um fb 720 neck i <laughs> mm, i mm. n i well, I don't know what I is. Stroke two. Oh, N I. No, that's because that two N. Oh, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna guess two is Alnico two. That's, that's just a guess, obviously. N is in brackets neck, obviously, because you've got B on the other one, which is a bridge one. So two B. So N I. Nickel. Oh yeah, nickel. Nickel insert might be insert <laughs> don't know i'm going to email someone and find out what all this stuff means because i still haven't had a definitive answer from anyone <laughs> anyway <laughs> moving on one of the things i noticed here on the bridge pickup it's got a plastic spacer before the the pickup surround and I think, I think that's plastic. I don't know. No, I think it's, that's, that is metal. That is metal, which is good. Okay, a moment of truth. Okay, so there's just a fairly substantial route. Bit of sawdust. Uh, just for the uh, just for the switch, really. Cool. Um, switchcraft or switchcraft style switch. There you go. Let's pop that back. And here's the control cavity. So like all inspired by Gibson's, it's showing CTS 500K pots. The plug-in connectors for the, the pickups. And this has got big old orange drop style caps in this, isn't it? Look, um, 0.22s, these are. Caps are wired from the hot lug on the tone to the center lug on the volume. Okay, just move that out of the way so you might be able to see that more clearly. There you go. Nice, nice and tidy. And finally, truss rod cover. I have found some wonky screws. 
I wonder if that will show on camera. There you go. <laughs> it's too good to be true, wasn't it? Right. And the great, I mean, the thing, whether it's a great thing or not, is up to you. These, obviously, the logo is, is on the truss rod cover, which is exactly the same as the Gibson one. So if you wanted to, if you, if you didn't feel that Epiphone was, was the right name on your headstock, you could put a, a Gibson truss rod cover on and fool yourself, couldn't you? <laughs> Let's have a look at the truss rod. Here you go. Just the normal Allen wrench type. Standard Epiphone job. Nice and tidy. Let's put it back together. Let's put some strings on. Tune it up. Plug it in. See what it sounds like. Here we are. So, in spite of me saying it, it's massive, it is very comfortable to play sitting down, seems nicely balanced. You know, if you let go of the neck there, obviously it's gonna dive, but it's just because it's not balanced, not because it's heavy, I don't think. So I'm used to SGs, obviously, and a lot of people think that the SG neck feels long. <laughs> this is kind of like in another postcode, really, but not in an awkward way. It feels good, actually. I'll tell you what I noticed when I started playing this at home, which, which I thought was interesting. It probably isn't, but I started playing here. I suppose because of the length of the... or the apparent length. It's probably not a lot different, to be honest with you, but it feels like, whoa. I started playing some stuff here. started playing that. I know it is something. I don't know what it is. What is it? Don't know what that is. That was right. Okay, so rig Princeton 65 today cranked. Now there's no pedals on that. That was just a guitar, pretty much on 10 then. But the amps cranked through an attenuator. Here's the settings of the amp. I'm not using any pedals at all today because, as you can hear, we've already got. You've got enough gain, really, haven't you? Yeah, not bad. So no pedals, uh, and obviously that cleans up quite nicely. Let's just roll it back to about eight. You got. That's on the neck pickup and then on the bridge pickup. Eight.
Just the amp, no pedals. So these pickups are pretty sweet. Let's play something. Go through the tone and volume control. Volume. And then, as you can hear, there's a real nice roll off there. sudden right at the end from 0 to 2 but rest of the way there's a nice sweep same there Tones. Stuff going on, isn't there? Not bad, not bad at all. That was the Epiphone Firebird. Hopefully, 
I've done it justice and got some good sounds out of it. Uh, this week, I'm recording this without actually having listened back to the stuff I played. Played a lot this week. Took me a while to get my mojo working, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it does. So this morning, I've come in and I've done some more. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, that was better. Never really know until you listen to it back. I did give myself a hard time. It's very difficult demonstrating guitars. You know, my job was to try and demonstrate what a guitar sounds like to, to you, knowing that most of you are probably way better players than I am. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure, guys, a lot of pressure. So anyway, hopefully, I've done my best, all right? That's all I ever do, I've done my best. And there's some clean sounds as well, hopefully. Now, actually, I will say that earlier, I know earlier I said that I wasn't using any drive pedals at all this week, but I did sneak on the soul food a, 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 a couple of times this morning when I was playing. But I'll show you, I'll put in the, you know, the Crocs cam so you can see when I, if I tread on a pedal. I might not, I might not even include that. Don't know yet, I haven't edited it, so we'll see. Anyway, should we get to the point? <laughs> I like it, well, yeah, I really like it. What I found is that it sounds good in all positions. Three positions that I was quite happily switching between from time to time and, and enjoying what I was hearing. You know what I mean? Often you, you, you switch positions and then you give it a couple of minutes to go, oh, no, I'll go back to the bridge. You know, everyone plays on the bridge, don't they, most of the time. I'm getting ahead of myself a bit, but I was just looking on Reverb to see what variations of this there were available. Um, I'll put a link in the description box. There's a bunch of the Firebird ones, the, the limited edition one that, you know, Jay Bonamassa, Firebird one, Treasure they called it, a while back. I briefly owned one before I stupidly sold it. There's some of them. And I was just thinking, well, you know what? Now, I wouldn't buy a Firebird one because I think that the neck pickup on this and the, the variations are, are definitely worth having. So again, these Epiphone inspired by Gibsons, what fantastic value and fantastic guitars they are. I love that you can get into ownership of such a, a distinctive guitar that you wouldn't necessarily want to go and spend a lot of money on because it's a little bit quirky and it might not be, you know, what you're looking for. <laughs> You know, as I said earlier, I discovered that the hard way. <laughs> I bought a Gibson, thought, oh, what have I done? And I sold it again quick. I traded it again pretty quick. But with this, £499, you know, it's almost like, well, yeah, take a punt on that, can't I? The used market for these will be good, you know. Ignore what anyone says about Epiphone's not holding their value. You'd lose a lot less on this than you would on a Gibson. There's a couple that I want to add to my list. So, of course, you know, Explorer. I haven't got an Explorer. I can get an Explorer for 500 quid. 
I just looked on Reverb to see what was available. There's some, you know, Explorer. I only do it in Ebony, I think, at the moment, the new one. But that's that's listed for 499 in stock. It's not going to be long, is it? And the Flying V, the Karina Flying V, or even the Mahogany Flying V from Epiphone, that's got to be in my collection. Um, pretty much then, I will have owned, I will own, yeah, I will have, I will own, yeah, I will, most classic Gibson models in the Epiphone, inspired by Gibson range. Which is brilliant. So um, all we need now is for Epiphone to release SG Junior, uh, 56 gold top with P90s. Everyone wants one of those. Um, and then, you know, we'll be quitting. And then if you find one that you really like, oh, if you find that a Firebird is really your groove, then you might want to invest in a more expensive version from Gibson you know, in a particular colour that you fancy. So these are great tasters and you can own the whole collection for <laughs> as much as it would cost to buy one Gibson custom shop. I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh yeah, <laughs> when I bought this um, online, Guitar Guitar, I was offered a a soft case for it, which looked really cool. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea because I know this doesn't fit in any other of my cases. So I bought a Gator soft case that looked great with it. I thought, well, that looks really cool, 50 quid. This, a Gator soft case. I thought it looked really good. I thought it looked more robust than it is. That's what, that's what I wanted to show you. It's very flimsy. It's really no more than a gig bag. It costs 50 quid. It's better than nothing, but I was a bit disappointed. I thought it'd be one of those solid things, but it turned up in a small box, which set alarm bells ringing. But it's better than nothing. As I say, if you get a case, it's quite long, <laughs> and it needs, uh, needs a couple of removal people to carry it around. Apart from that, it's a great guitar. It really is a great guitar. I'm so pleased I got this. I'm so pleased I got this and spent some time with it. And um, I've got a, a bigger stand, <laughs> floor stand, so at one of those floor neck stands. Do you know what I mean? I'll show you. Yeah, I've got one of these. <laughs> I bought it ages ago. I don't use it because it takes up so much space. Uh, but I'm going to have to use it now because I've bought a Firebird and it's massive and it takes up loads of space. But it's worth it. So... Uh, yeah, don't let that put you off. I've just noticed that I've still got the uh, still got the plastic on the pickups. And I didn't even notice that. I wonder how much that affects the tone. Well, what you can say is it will sound even better than it did. There you go. That's it. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for joining me. Come back again. Same time, same place next week and see what we're up to then. Yeah, look forward to it. Ta-ra for now. Yeah.